So hello, we are live streaming on Facebook. Now I have to see whether I can really confirm that. Yes, okay. So welcome to Dreams of UN. I'll be talking to you about my experiences, how I got a job at the United Nations. I've been working for the United Nations for 10 years paid, actually nine years paid because I had a lot of breaks in between and I was doing a lot of NGO work beforehand. And I'm addressing people who are interested in working at the United Nations. So you may be somebody who has already taken some steps. You may already know how to get a job at the United Nations, or you may still be wondering, how the heck do I get there? So I'm going to talk to you today about my experiences as A representative working for the United Nations. Oops, my camera's not on. Okay, so I've had a number of technical issues, so this is um, a lot of learning by doing, which is another group that I'm working with. So I'm going to tell you what it was like for me, and I'm passionate about working for the United Nations. I wanted to work at the United Nations and eventually managed to just get invited to participate as an NGO representative. Now, when I came to Vienna, I had no idea that Vienna was a United Nations city. You may already be aware, but you may not, that the United Nations is not only in New York. Headquarters is in New York, and New York is definitely the biggest office of the United Nations. And Geneva is the second biggest office of the United Nations. Vienna is the third office, and Nairobi is the fourth. But United Nations is everywhere. United Nations is the collection of 192 member states who have signed the Charter of the United Nations. I personally was working for the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has 162 member states. So it's the countries that have signed the charter to join that are members of these organizations, of these international organizations. And the United Nations is a family of organizations. Now, last time I'm had a presentation ready. Now let me go back into my presentation. It takes the whole screen up so it gets a bit complicated so I'm just monitoring what's happening on the um, on the screen. Now I'm going to do screen share and back to screen one. Okay so you should see my presentation now and I'll just go through it with you. So I'll turn my camera off so that it doesn't cover parts of the presentation. This is a great experience. And if you want to work at the United Nations, it's good to be prepared to learn as you go along. Now, this was in 2003 when I was an NGO representative and the conference room at that time. And I was meeting with ambassadors. This is the ambassador of Albania for the um, defense, in who we met at the United Nations. At that time, there was still a cafe in the UN in Vienna, in the entrance part where you actually go through before you even have to identify yourself and be, when you get into the international territory. And this was my NGO badge at that time in 2007. And 
I was also in Geneva. This was an international conference that I attended in Geneva on the 4th of July. I think that was 2007 or 2008. And what I loved about Geneva was the gardens. You have a beautiful view of the lake and there are even peacocks, live birds in the, in the gardens walking around freely in Geneva at the United Nations. I was in New York in 2003. This was a conference of young people from Palestine and Israel, a service for peace project also sponsored by an NGO. And at one stage, I really, really determined I am going to get a job at the United Nations. So I sat down, this was in the rotunda in the, on the third floor at the press office. I sat down at the desk with one of our correspondents and had my photo taken, pretending to be working at the United Nations. Well, I was working, I was doing my NGO representation work and reporting, but I was determined, I really wanted to work at the United Nations. So I took this photo as if I was working there. And that was a few years before I actually got my job at the United Nations. Who knows how serious I was at that time that I really wanted it. I wanted it. And a couple of years later, I had my own desk and I was working at the VIC at the United Nations. Before that, I became secretary of the Drugs Committee, the Narcotic Drugs Committee, the NGO Committee on Narcotic Drugs. And we organized, it was the first time that the NGO community organized a major conference at the VIC, at the United Nations in Vienna. And the NGO representatives were those who were speaking and the member states were the guests. It's typically the opposite of that. When you're at a meeting at the United Nations, the member states have their, their country labels on the tables all across the meeting room. And the NGOs have just a few spaces delegated to them where they can take their positions. This conference beyond 2008 was the reverse, where the NGOs had their positions at the front and the member states had the last two rows at the back. And I was leading this team of young volunteers who were supporting us in organizing and initiating this conference. I also met the president of the conference of NGOs, Liberto Batista, I believe he's still in that position, is still very active there internationally. And this was with the president of the Women's Federation and we were actually representing Women's Federation International because here in Vienna, we have the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime and UNODC and the IAEA and a number of other organizations which are the headquarters. So you have the United Nations in New York, you have United Nations office in Geneva, you have United Nations office in Vienna and United Nations office in Nairobi. Now these are United Nations offices as well as all the other family of organizations belonging to the United Nations. And Women's Federation was representing the international NGO here at the, this was the Drugs Committee meeting here in Vienna. At that time, I was also acting as the press secretary for the NGO committee. And I filmed this press conference that the president and chair of the NGO committee, Drugs Committee gave and posted that and became quite proud of myself for what I could do. And it was coming into the UN situation as, a, as an outsider, as an NGO representative, and taking on a substantial role and fulfilling a certain responsibility that gave me the confidence that I too can do something much more. So what 
I'm addressing here is if you want to work at the United Nations, you need to be clear what you really want, who you really are, and be prepared to work at that aspect, whatever it is, including your own self-confidence. So it may mean getting involved in various activities so that you can expose your expertise. Now, quite typically, and especially now, as I set myself up as the expert for working at the United Nations, I am totally aware of my inadequacies. Most important, don't draw attention to them. Focus on what you know, on what your expertise is, and work on building your own confidence on what you can do. When I finally got my job, I was working for the IAEA, for the Publications Department, and shortly afterwards, I joined in August 2009, and in September is the General Conference, and I was asked to man the publication stand where the members came to buy the publications from the IAEA. And a few months later, I was working for the Division of Nuclear Security, and Anita Nielsen was the director and the founder of the Division of... At that time, it, it was called the Office of nuclear security and this was a great team of people to work with there are two section heads here peter colgan and milosh i've forgotten his name i'll remember it later and um, these were the various implementation assistants secretaries um, the boss's secretary and uh, accountants and other staff who were working together with me in the Division of Nuclear Security. Here in my office, I hung up my Aussie flag. Now, when you join the United Nations, you have to sign a declaration of confidentiality. So that means everything I'm telling you now is already public knowledge. I was compelled to sign the Declaration of Confidentiality, meaning that I would not share anything that came to my attention, that came into my sphere of work, any of my knowledge which was secret. And in the Division of Nuclear Security, we had access to confidential information which is not to be shared publicly so it is important also when you become a staff member at the united nations that's one of the ways to work at the united nations then you also commit to working solely for the United Nations, in my case, it was the International Atomic Energy Agency. And in that declaration, it said, or I said, that the needs of the agency and of the director were my total priority, even beyond my personal needs and desires. In other words, I was totally committed 100% day and night to do whatever the director, the general director of the IAEA wanted of me. And that includes that you have to um, subordinate your national identity for the interests of the international identity. So what I often say is my values uh, interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. Now, if that Australian flag on the wall behind me on, at my desk in my office at the UN was my defining factor, my identity, I would have had a serious problem because 
in my work at the IAEA, I was not representing Australia. The IAEA is the body that represents nuclear security for the world to overcome all of the issues and the problems that we have in the relationships internationally. And we need to know that we can have confidence in this body as the, the, the body that we can really trust and rely on without the conflict of national interest. So even though some people put their flag up in their office, it's important to recognize you are not a New Zealander or an Australian or an American at the UN. You are representing the community of nations. You are an international civil servant. I was very involved. But this was um, International Women's Day. And there are many United Nations International Days that are being celebrated on the grounds of the United Nations. And here, the women in nuclear and many of my colleagues from within the workforce of the IAEA of the United Nations, as well as the NGOs came together for this major celebration. Here on this photo, you can see a little bit of my history. On the left is the first boss that I had in nuclear security. On the right is the second. And this was the farewell for the guy in the middle. And he was my boss when I left. He came back. He, he, this was a farewell for him. And he, he had a break in service and then came back and became the section head where I was working for the information management in nuclear security. Now, what I want to say with this is that when you enter the United Nations as a professional, I'm talking specifically at the moment actually about the IAEA. The IAEA is the major technical organization within the UN and the IAEA is constantly hiring and recruiting professionals and they typically have a limited con contract Usually it starts with two years and then you get a one year extension. You can have five years and maximum of seven years. And after seven years, you have to rotate out. Why? Because the IAEA as a technical institution, a scientific organization, wants to have the latest standard and wants to recruit people who are at the cutting edge of technology and science. And so, when people have already been employed for seven years, they have to take a break of at least one year and they can be re recruited again after one year's time. So my boss at that time was the um, working for the American government and he went back to his government job and then came, came back again to the United Nations. This varies, you need to look at the different situations that are available. So I'll give another presentation next time, much more structured. This time I'm, I'm taking freehand in um, sharing a little bit more about my own situation. And um, I'll give you a little bit more information about the, the, the structure. But actually, if you really want to work at the United Nations, it's important that you also do your own homework that you figure out where you really want to go and why. Now, one of my slides, I think it's towards the end now, um, was about the pay scale. Because if you think it's going to be good money and that's why you want to work at the UN, you might be right. It might be good money for you. Though many of my colleagues, especially the nuclear physicists, said they actually went down quite a bit in their wages working for the IAEA, that they got much better pay in, in industry outside. The pay scale relates to the American public service level. That would be where you would, they 
look to to the equivalence of what's happening. It is an international analysis, but America has the um, majority in the population, and so it's the standard. The you could basically say it's the the standard of the American civil service that the pay of the United Nations uh, is equivalent to, and according to where your mission is based, you may get a, a supplement or an adjustment according to your where you are based. This this photo here is where I was filming a presentation done by one of my colleagues in nuclear security for the women in nuclear. So what I want to say here is working for the United Nations, you could be a diplomat, you could be the ambassador to your country in New York, and that's also working for the United Nations. You could be a secretary and you could be a representative for your mission for your country and have a badge to enter the United Nations. I mentioned at the very beginning my activities as an NGO representative, which was still working unpaid, okay, zero compensation. Now, the types of jobs that you can have at the United Nations, my, my passion in sharing this idea of a dream job UN is I want to encourage young professional women to really apply for the jobs at the United Nations if that's what you want. And my most important tip if you want a job at the United Nations would be apply. Apply. So you need to go and do your homework. You need to search. You need to find the web pages. And it's not just UN jobs. There is the UNIDO, UNODC, the Crime Commission, the, the International Labor Office. There are many, many organizations in the structure of the United Nations, and they are located all over the world. So you need to decide why do you want to work for the United Nations? How badly do you want to work for the United Nations? And what are your priorities? Because may, when actually when I signed my contract, or actually part of the, the job description at the very bottom of the application, it was said that when you get a job at the UN, you are at the, the disposal of the UN and you could be posted anywhere. Are you ready for that? Are you prepared to go anywhere in the world on that mission that you have been given? Is that how badly you want to work for the United Nations? So I'm really looking for passionate world changers who feel called and typically ambassadors international representatives at the IAEA scientists, top level professionals, directors, section heads, are the people that we think of working at the United Nations. Yet in Vienna we have interns at the IAEA who earn a thousand euros a month for their internship at the UN. In New York and UNIDO and UNODC, the internships are not paid. You have the privilege of working for the United Nations as a staff member, as an intern. You get to do all the jobs that the other staff members are doing. You might feel like you're being given the, the dirty work or the, or the menial task. Yet, it is exactly by going through these step-by-step -step projects, 
through this process that you learn the most about how things work, the structure, the relationships with people, how to get things done, where to go to get something done. And once you have that basis, then you have a really good foundation for the next level. So, like I said, next time I'll discuss more clearly the structure, but there are G-type jobs, which is administrative, and P-type jobs, which is the professional. So it's the professionals that the IAEA that I was talking about that have to rotate out after seven years. The G staff do not have to do that. So many of my colleagues who were G staff, who had master's and doctor's degrees, were very happy to be working in their G staff position because they were staff members who received a fixed term contract where they could stay in the position and did not have to rotate out. Whereas the professionals were compelled after a seven year period, some only got five years, some only two. There are also consultants and the interns I already mentioned and junior professional officers. Often a member state, an embassy will support junior professional officers. So the whole United Nations is funded by member state contributions. And according to how much the member state contributes to the international fund, the United Nations will also employ that many people corresponding to, from that country, corresponding to the contribution that that country makes. So if your country is contributing in a major way to the program of the UN, then you may have a good chance through your embassy to get support to find a position in the United Nations. The members, some member states, many member states, make a contribution in kind, meaning they will pay for one or more staff member in a particular area of their interest and then also maintain the jurisdiction to determine who is sitting in that position. In other words, sometimes they will pay for a position and it has to be somebody from their country. Many European countries actually do these types of contributions, supporting third world countries in their nuclear security projects. So many of the European Union projects are supporting Africa and South America in particular nuclear security projects. And that is the way that they are contributing to the program of the United Nations and to world peace. I've said before, I love working for the United Nations because it's a way of working together with people from different countries, different backgrounds, different religions, contributing to exciting projects like nuclear security and supporting women in nuclear where you see women young and old working together and meeting together and having fun. And at this stage, it was the American ambassador gave us a talk and then we had a lunch together. And it's valuable to get involved in the aspect where you can be in a professional community, in a network. It's very important to network. This is also a Women in Nuclear project. So the lady beside me is the, was the uh, president of the French Nuclear Association and was, I think he's currently again the international president of Women in Nuclear. At that time in 2012, she was also the international president. Now, we also had lots of fun. We had Christmas parties and birthday parties and other activities. 
Now, just to tell you how things are developing, in this particular room, this was our conference room in the Division of Nuclear Security. And as the office grew, I think we had about 50 people when I started and 112 when I left. We ran out of space because nuclear security is top security and we were behind glass doors. And it was a very limited area. So this conference room got divided up into three offices. And our storage room also became an office. So these types of celebrations that we had in the early days when I was working there may not take place in the same way. In fact, change is inevitable. Change will be happening all the time and it's important to be flexible. You need, if you want to work at the United Nations, you need to be innovative. You need to know how to find the answers that you need. You need to have good relationships with people and figure out how you can get along regardless of nationality, religion, culture. Now this comes from the website un.org and it talks about the mission of the United Nations. What do we do? Maintain international peace and security? Due to the powers vested in its charter and its unique international character, the United Nations can take action on issues confronting humanity in the 21st century, including maintain international peace and security, protect human rights, deliver humanitarian aid, promote sustainable development, uphold international law. Now, you will always find people who are negative, who will criticize. My question to you, what are you doing about it? How are you contributing? Are you living in abundance and in positivity and optimism and seeing the solutions that you can offer, that you can bring? Or are you living in, what's the word in English? Mangel in German, in, in deficiency or deficit. Do you have deficit thinking? And are you always looking at how everybody else is doing everything wrong and complaining about what they don't do right? I'm looking for those passionate world changers who really want to do something good and are prepared to invest themselves in helping the UN fulfill its charter. You may want to work in New York. You may want to work work in Geneva, you may want to work in Bangkok or Paris or Italy. You may be lucky enough to live in one of those cities where the United Nations has a base. So for G staff, for the admin staff, you have the advantage when you're already living in a place where the United Nations is, that they recruit locally. So when you are recruited locally as a G staff, as the admin, then you can work in that office where you are and you are not likely to be sent anywhere else. When you apply for a professional position, things have changed a lot over the last two years due to Corona. However, it, it, not only that, even the last 10 years while I was working there, things changed a lot. So what I want to tell you is typically when you apply for a professional post, it used to be that you would be invited to the place where you would be employed for an in-person live interview. If the number of applicants was more than a certain number. They used, they used to go through filter 
the application, select the qualified people, and select a short list of about five people. And if there were many, many, many people who were really qualified, then they would put them through the next filtering process through a video interview, a Sonru interview, where you would have a series of questions and a video camera, a program that you would have to answer those questions yourself and submit your interview. And after that, only if you succeeded through that level and came into the next selection process, then you would be invited for a personal interview. So to get a job at the United Nations, you need determination and patience. I was applying for years and after my initial testing, first there was even, it's not always the case, it depends on the position, sometimes there is testing involved. They want to be sure that you have the necessary skills, capacity and qualifications to fulfill the role that they're looking to fill. And in the admin staff, these are certain language skills and typing skills and accuracy. So there was testing involved and it was near about eight or nine months before I started work after that testing procedure. And for many professionals, they're waiting a year or two before they finally get their confirmed job offer and it is always, always, always on probation. Your probation period may be six or 12 months. So on a professional post, when you are on probation, they want to check to, to be sure that you can really fulfill your responsibilities in that position. Yet many professionals have told me it takes them two years to figure out how everything works. The United Nations in its conglomeration of 192 countries People working together from every culture, every religion, every background. You need to learn how to cooperate with these different people and how to work in that environment, how to get your job done. And some people would like the wheels to turn a little bit faster. In fact, I was warned at one of my interviews that I should never ever make any corrections to any documents that I'm given because they had found that some keen young secretaries would be correcting things that they thought were wrong when in fact it was the UN language that had been polished and used over the years in this particular way. So it may even be an advantage to do one year as an intern because once you've picked up the ropes and you've understood how things really work and you've proven yourself in your own relationship with your professional colleagues and you've gained a reputation as a person who is capable who listens to the instructions and fulfills them and reports back accordingly whether they can or cannot fulfill. Once a person has proven that they can work in this environment, then they are very gladly seen and eagerly accepted into the advertised position. So the thing is, when you see a job advertised at the United Nations that you want to apply for, apply for it, absolutely, by all means. The more often you apply, don't get dis 
discouraged. If you get invited to an interview, learn from it. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes the positions that are advertised have already been earmarked for somebody who is already working in the organisation and is preparing for a promotion into that position. However, the United Nations requires that they hire the best person in the world in that position. So they have to advertise and they have to get a certain number of candidates in order to give that position to a selected candidate. So it's always worthwhile applying and be encouraged. If you are invited to an interview, it means you are qualified. You have reached the standards. You will not be invited to an interview if you are not qualified. So in your application process, don't just apply for everything that you see, whether you're qualified or not, but look at what you really want, where you really want to go, what you want to do, and what you are really qualified for, and apply for everything that fulfills those criteria. Get to the interviews. Get the experience with the interviews. Don't think that somebody else is already sitting on that position. Give everything to show your best you to the people there that are on the hiring committee. And the more often you get invited to interviews, the closer you are getting to get your dream job at the UN. For me, I joined the United Nations quite late after having my family, my children, and I had many different experiences beforehand. And after first being the invoicing clerk for the publications department, I became the data assistant for the Division of Nuclear Security. I was the contact management subject matter expert. I was invited into the planning meetings for the development of the computer program that was introduced in 2010. In fact, my main function at the IAEA was a temporary position for the implementation of the AIDS program, the computer program that was implemented at that time. And I became the recognized subject matter expert. So have confidence in what you can give and don't let people put you down, but be prepared to listen and learn from the situations that you find yourself in. I've gone all over the place. I'm going to have to watch the replay and and really pinpoint, actually, what I really want is feedback. What are the questions that you really want answered? Because, of course, I'm offering a mentoring program and in the mentoring it's one-to-one. -one, so we go into all of those areas that you that you really need to address. And this is just a bit of an introduction into what I do that you can get a feel. Do you think we can work together? Can I help you? Does my Aussie accent upset you? If it does, be aware there are other people working at the UN who have completely different accents who you may find it even more difficult to understand. So just be careful about what you're thinking about and what you love and what you're passionate about. 
So these are the slides I covered last time, the structure of the United Nations. These are the things you need to look at. You need to do your research and you can see that the United Nations itself has many, many different areas of expertise. So whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a cleaning lady or a chemist or a secretary, the UN is employing every type of person. The UN is all over the world. And even the, the job structures, there are unpaid interns, as I said. There are short-term contracts for interpreters and translators. I think I've got a slide at the end. I'll, I'll just go through this and go through to the end. As the world's only truly universal global organization, the United Nations has become the foremost forum to address issues that transcend national boundaries and cannot be resolved by any one country acting alone. So this is the slide that I was talking about, that if you want to join the United Nations because you think it's good pay, check it out. There is a website where you can see exactly according, of course, you don't know where you are going to be slotted in, how your qualifications are going to be analyzed, accepted, recognized. You, you might go through a situation like me where after four months of working in a particular category, I was offered a position one grade lower. Typically that never happens. Once you are a paid staff member, they cannot uh, degrade you anymore but I was a temporary assistant so my first contract was temporary assistance for three months my second contract was a one month extension and my third contract was a three or six months another temporary assistant on a lower level but I was passionate I wanted to work at the United Nations so even though I was a communications trainer self-employed and was working in kids school teaching English when I received my invitation to come in for the interview I wanted to work at the United Nations and continued even at a lower grade and then still got what I am telling you now was my dream job as the data assistant in the division of nuclear security so the different types of jobs the professional, directors, section heads, field officers. We know even the, the peacekeeping forces are in the field. The interpreters and translators have short-term contracts. The general service and related categories, even the restaurant staff and the people in the shop in the, ground, in the basement here in Vienna have certain related categories position. The pensionable remuneration. You are eligible for a pension from the United Nations when you have worked for five years. It's not payable until you reach the pension age of 65 now, if you join now. When I joined the UN, it was 62. Some of my colleagues working at the United Nations had been working there for 30 years, and when they joined, the retirement age was 60. So they are still eligible to go into early retirement at 58. If you join the UN now and you pay into the pension fund for five years, you can take all of that money out again after your five years or 10 years of service, or you can leave it sitting there and you will be eligible for a UN pension when you reach retirement age. However, if you work for less than five years, if you pay into the pension fund for under five years, you will automatically just be refunded the contributions that you made into the pension fund. Internship is a perfect way for young people to enter on the grassroots level. If you have time, so this is again attitude, it's a matter of deciding what do you really want. You might think you don't have time for an internship. You've got to earn money now. Believe me, if you have 
this grassroots experience, you will also be a sought after candidate. When you have on your CV that internship or that other position, then you are a proven international civil servant. They know that you know the ropes, you know how the system works, and they will be happy to give you a position if they feel that you are qualified to fulfill that position. I think that's the last slide. My values, interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. Dream Job UN, I'm looking for people who are passionate for working at the United Nations, and I want to support you. I want to support you because I believe in the United Nations. I want to have those good people in there. Now, believe me, the UN is like the whole world. There are people who are in it for themselves, and there are people who know how to use the system. And I believe that a system is only as good as the people in it. And I really, really, really believe that the United Nations has the potential to fulfill its mission, its mandate, when the people working within it are also prepared to invest themselves and that we can really build what I would call a true parents United Nations, where people really feel this parental heart and love. I really believe that we need people who are mature enough to know that we need to learn how to give, how to serve. So let me share with you what my own boss said at my farewell when I retired from the UN. He revealed to my colleagues that I was a missionary for 10 years in Australia before I started working at the IAEA. And he said, so I probably came, actually uh, perhaps I will get that video, but you can only see him from the back, that I probably came to save the UN. And, he, and I'll tell you something, he said, she did. I was so gratified because I knew I had invested a lot in fixing up those issues with the contact management. Not everything, got fixed according to my desires, but I know I made a major contribution. And hearing that from my own boss as I left, saying not that they were kicking me out, but they would have loved to have kept me longer, but the rules were that I could no longer continue working there. So there are other ways to contribute. You'll always find a way. If you are passionate, if you want to work, for the United Nations, then decide what is the most important for you. What are your priorities? What price are you prepared to pay? Are you prepared to travel? Are you prepared to get a lower income? If your motivation is to earn the money and to be in New York or, or Abu Dhabi, wherever, and that's why you want a job at the UN. Try it out, see what happens. Personally, I believe it's important to clarify your vision, your goal, decide what you really want. Do your homework, do your research. Everything is already there. There are YouTube videos about finding a job at the UN and all the databases where you can put your name in and do your searches and figure out how many different types of jobs there are. But apply for the ones that you are qualified for and get into the interview process. I'm known as a bridge builder, tenacious, networking. I've got an infectious laugh. I really want to invest my communication talents in mentoring you if you are eager to work at the United Nations. I'm still actively involved in the Rhetoric Club, the Toastmasters Club at the Vienna International Center. I support a lot of professionals and young people who are passionate 
about doing something and I'm very, very happy to have a mentoring session with you. Just make an appointment, click on the calendar link to set up a date. We can have a chat and decide whether we're a good fit. If I can mentor you, if you are prepared to pay the price that's required. To invest yourself. There are no guarantees. I can't promise you a job at the UN. If I believe in you, I can give a recommendation. When you make an application, you have to name two referees. And I believe that it's important to really invest in good relationships, in good values, and in doing what you know is right and good for you and those that you cherish and love. So that's it in terms of the presentation. I think I'll stop the... Um, live streaming and this will be available on Facebook in the Dream Job UN group. So if you're really interested, you can sign up on Facebook, even though I'm actually focusing on, on LinkedIn in my outreach because it's typically professionals that are working at the United Nations, it's another whole area. Uh, when I started working at the UN, Facebook was brand new, right? And some people got quite addicted and we were really warned we should not be using our work time on social media. And there are checks. The admin, the IT department has access to what you're doing there. So you're not a private person, you're a public person. And I even heard of some people who got into trouble. I don't know whether because of their Facebook activities, but some content in their email, which is being monitored. So I was often on Facebook at lunchtime during my breaks and never during my working periods. But I had colleagues on the other side in the other building in UNODC and they had already launched their social media campaign. And they were not only in Facebook but tweeting and Twittering and and promoting all sorts of stuff. And I when I went into Facebook at lunchtime and I saw my colleagues that all been there all day and were posting. So I'm posting this on Facebook Live in my group, Dream Job UN, in the recognition and understanding that even this scientific organization, the IAEA, is becoming more and more involved and interactive in social media. It's new. They need young people who are savvy in this language. So a lot of things change and develop and I must say they change and develop faster and faster and faster. So even though I can't promise you that the UN is changing quickly, if you are passionate about making a contribution, you could help in that area if that's your expertise and your passion whatever it is that you feel called to contribute have confidence get the support that you need get the mentoring and and the network to support you listen to the positive voices that can help you along this way and I think that on that note, I'm planning a presentation 
on Dream Job UN each Wednesday morning, Central European time at 10 o'clock for the next couple of weeks. So you can join me here again in a week's time. You can book a call with me for a private session and the mentoring program will be beginning shortly. I'm still going through lots and lots of technical issues, so still working on my web page and my offer and all of those other things. So you can see all the negative things you want to see yourself, or you can see all the positive things and do something positive and make a contribution and make this world a better place. So I'm turning off the live stream and we can continue Wait on live, live, ooh, Facebook, 